Um, listen, one of the things that we do here that is pivotal to your growth, a lot of times people go through things and they ask questions like, well, did you know? And I'm like, we don't know you unless you serve. There's no way for us to know you at this church unless you're serving or unless you're a part of the dream team in some capacity, because we don't know who you are. And so I want to put that out there. Uh, and this is for anybody watching. This is for anybody. That's why text Palms Connect. You want to join the dream team. If you're on the dream team, can you make some noise? Yeah, it sounds like the majority because that is our thing. Everybody says, you're a get in church. Like, you better believe it, big boy. We are get in church. Why? Because we know that it, it will save your life to be part of the local body of believers and to get in community. That's why our groups are so important. That's why it's so important to be a part of the, the serving um, and being a part of the local church, the giving, giving, serving. Those are huge pieces of what we do here because uh, we're, we're pushing and we're going to go forward with the gospel anywhere God sends us. He's sending us to a building in Oakland, Maryland that we'll be launching our church, another location, a broadcast location in on March 31st. Y'all excited about that? Excited about you guys have given to that. Uh, we have multiple organizations that have given as well, but you have given to that. And uh, right here, even in-house, we've raised over $60,000 in one offering that you guys gave a couple of months ago as a, a faith one-day offering, and God is multiplying that. Uh, in fact, we will have more than three times that amount uh, overall by the time we launch this church from organizations and other things that have allowed us to be uh, kind of financially a little bit more stable when it comes to launching this. We own a building in another state, so you got to appreciate that. Uh, people say, what about here? I don't know. We're missional. So we may be in a building like this forever. Who knows? As long as we're launching churches. Um, but I really believe that 2025 is the year we're going to get a building. I believe in that, that, that next year is kind of the year we're going to start doing some of those things here locally, because I believe as God continues to multiply us, there's some things we're going to need. And one is a solid internet. And Pastor Corey said, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. He's waving at me already. Um, but those are big things, but I'm excited. Are y'all excited to be a part of what God is doing more? I mean, abroad, we are, we are, uh, we have a worldwide mindset and I'm just so excited because people need Jesus. Uh, you know, I think in, in our life, when God speaks to us, a lot of people have the questions, what does God want me to do with my life? But God speaks to us. Uh, we know something deep within us when he speaks. So you say, well, I've never really heard from God. You, I, I, I can promise you that God has spoken to you at some point in your life, multiple times. And when God speaks to us, we always say, well, I don't know what God sounds like or what does God want me to do with my life? Those are kind of the famous words. But confusion comes not because we don't know if God spoke. It comes when we interject after he spoke. God speaks. We just try to mold it into what we want to hear. Uh, at the beginning of every year, I usually take the month of January and it kind of started um, because I hated fasting food. And so I started walking instead. And you say, well, that's what fasting is about. I get it. But there was a couple years where I just told my wife, I said, I don't feel like God's calling the church to this. I don't feel like he's calling me to this. I feel like he's saying, get up early and walk with me for a couple hours every morning. And it was great. In fact, my oldest son, we had pictures of us being on the boardwalk. We lived in the oceanfront. We'd walk together. And so I would walk for a couple miles every morning or most mornings um, and just pray. And it kind of turned into something I started doing in January every year, unintentionally, even this year, I think God tricked me. Uh, I started walking. It was early. I was like, you know, that Christmas and New Year's feast I was trying to get off. I was like, well, I'm just going to walk a little bit before I work out. Next thing I know, I'm putting in miles and miles. I'm uh, two hours before I even get my day started. I'm walking and praying uh, and working out. And uh, I, I kind of felt like God tricked me this year, but it was a good thing. You know, it's like, God, you got me. But what he spoke to me this year in January before I even started walking say, Brandon, what's the rush? It's that simple. For those of you who don't know me, I got four boys, 13, 11, one that's about to be eight or nine, nine, and one that's about to be seven. All right. And you say, what's the rush? What's the rush to build as many campuses as you can? What's the rush to get as rich as you can? What's the rush to be as successful as you want? What's the rush to get these kids out your house? We all know the answer to that. But what's the rush? And I would ask you that. And it wasn't that God was saying, don't be ambitious. It wasn't that he was saying, I mean, he handed us a campus that we're launching. We didn't ask for that. He showed us the vision in 2020, and now he's handing us something in 2024. So it's not that he's saying, don't go and do the things, but he's asking me, Brandon, what's the rush? What are you running for? What's the sprint all about? Have you ever waited for something and you've worked for something and you went to achieve something 
And everything came down to this something. And then when that something came, you were extremely disappointed because it wasn't the something you thought you were working for when all the somethings were happening and you were making sacrifices. And then when you achieved that something, you're thinking, this is not what I had thought it was going to be. Has anybody ever felt that before? One of the reasons for that is that we always think that the destination is the purpose. We always think the end result is the goal. But it's not the goal. In fact, that's the, the, the title of today's message is finally. But the whole concept is we have to be willing to turn back. You see, we're in a rush. We're trying to get somewhere. We don't have time to turn back for people. We don't have time to turn back. Because turning back to us, you know what it means? Starting over. It means failure. It means a suspense of something that we're not in control of. Turning back to us is a term used for failure. It's not a term used for discipline. And that's the problem, because in your life, if you knew that you could go back to your 20s, how many of you would go back to your 20s and do things a little different to make a way for where you're at right now? Now, if you're willing to admit this in front of God and his people, some of us that are his people, some of you are still deciding, that's okay. Would you just give a shout if you really like to go back 20 years and just do it all over? Come on, you're saying, I want to do it over. See, you know what's funny about that is you're being honest. And this is the interesting thing about turning back. You're being very honest. But what you're saying is, I don't like to turn back when it's a destination, but if I could go back and do things different, I would love to because it would make things better right now. That's what turning back is about. Don't have to go there again. Don't have to go back and say, man, I wish that I was. I wish that I did because God will lead us in that. The Israelites were in the place where they had left Egypt. It said they left with defiantly. They took all of the gold. They took all of the wealth of the Egyptians, this powerful, most powerful country. They left and people are thinking, well, now what are we going to do? And the Hebrews are walking for days and they're not sleeping. It says there's a cloud by day and a fire by night. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, it says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, everybody say, finally, says, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route. Did y'all hear what I just said? He didn't lead them along the main road that would have made sense, even though that would have been the best route according to their maps. Google Maps and Apple Maps would have gone crazy when they took this detour. It said, if the people are faced with a battle, so wait, God's de- de- he's taking them on a detour because he knows they can't face the battle that they might come against, Right? He says they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way. Everybody say roundabout. How many of y'all hate the roundabout? Just put a stoplight in, right? (laughs) Through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The interesting thing about the Red Sea is that they didn't know they were going there. Thus, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. This doesn't mean they were warriors. It just meant they had a purpose. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear to do this. So Joseph, the coat of many colors, the one who came in with the right hand, uh, had, you know, during the famine, he brought all of Israel with him. He brought his father, his brothers. That's why the Israelites were in Egypt. It said, he made his son swear to do this. He said, God will certainly come to help you. And when he does, you must take my bones with you from this place. The Israelites left Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went ahead of them and he guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud and he provided light with a pillar of fire. He said, this allowed them to travel by day or night. Don't you love it when there's no rest stops? He said, the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. Everybody say, finally. You see, there's so many finalies here in this room. There are so many finalies. Finally, they leave me alone. Finally, people get off my back. Finally, God gives me what I deserve. Finally, I get this promotion. Finally, my kids stop acting like fools. Finally, I can go afford those shoes I wanted. Finally, I can go get that car that I deserve because I've worked so hard. Finally, my parents leave me. You you understand what I'm saying? But what happens is there are so many finalies here. Like finally, out of 430 years, we're out of here. There are so many finalies that we are too fed up to be grateful. That's what happens when God's doing something in your life. You just get too fed up to be grateful when he actually does what you've been praying for. Finally, 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 finally you're here. I love what it records in Numbers chapter 33, verse two. It said, at the Lord's direction, Moses kept a written record of their progress. These are the stages of their march, identified by the different places where they stopped along the way. They set out from the city of Ramses in early spring on the 15th day of the first month. 
On the morning after the first Passover celebration, the people of Israel left defiantly in full view of all the Egyptians. Meanwhile, the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn sons whom the Lord had killed the night before. The Lord defeated the gods of Egypt that night with great acts of judgment. After leading Ramses, the Israelites set up camp at Succoth and they left Succoth and they encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. They left Etham and turned back toward Pi-Haharoth opposite Baal Zephon and camped near Migdal. You see, the setting was the greatest day for the Israelites. 430 years, they're finally getting out, but it was the worst day for the Egyptians. Can you imagine what it was like leaving? When you left and you envisioned what it would be like hearing stories from your parents and your grandparents of what it would be like after 430 years of being enslaved, I'm pretty sure you would have envisioned a slight parade. You would have envisioned some confetti falling. You would have envisioned some kind of theme music that would have escorted you out of Egypt. This is how we do it, <laughs> right? You'd have been like, hey, hey, why? Because you're thinking this is how it's going to go down. You would not have envisioned that the way you were released was that everybody who you knew, whether or not you liked them, were wailing and they were burying their loved ones who had died. Young men, it didn't matter. The firstborn, all different shapes and sizes, you would never have thought that the way that you were going to go out was going to be they were burying mass graves everywhere. I would think that wasn't in the plan. I would think that that probably wasn't the way you had envisioned the finally coming to fruition. Can we agree on that? And I would envision the same thing goes for you in your life. There are things that God is doing and it's not the way you envisioned it. And so now you're not really grateful for it. Finally, God, There's anger, there's resentment, there's a complete lack of compassion on behalf of the Israelites. The people are mad, the mood is somber, broken, hopeless, traumatic, tragic on behalf of the Egyptians. The closest thing we could understand would be during 9-11, and for those of you that were alive during that time, the day that our nation was stuck to their televisions and we were weeping and mourning for thousands of people that died. Can you imagine millions of people in this country that would have died? And then all the people that did all the work for us leaving, yeah, they were slaves. It was wrong. But can you imagine the tragedy that the Israelites exited with is what I'm trying to get at. I'm pretty sure that wasn't the way they had pictured it. See, deliverance is not pretty. It's hard. Gosh, I wish people would get this. What makes you think that deliverance is easy? What makes you think that deliverance is something that's going to be what you want to put in your journal? You think deliverance is you and your husband having afternoon tea with a million dollars in your bank account, and you're sitting out on your veranda at one of your mini beach houses. You don't realize deliverance is waking up and praying for your spouse because they need delivered from an addiction or because they've hurt you so badly that you cry every morning and every night for a year. You don't think of deliverance as being something that physically makes you sick, that makes you vomit, that gives you a stomach ache you can't get rid of for months. You don't think of deliverance as something that causes medical issues to where you have to get prescriptions to fix brokenness in your physical body because of pain you're going through spiritually. We don't think of deliverance as finally God did it, and we were patient and we're grateful. We think of it as, well, God, it's about time. Because deliverance will never look like what you think. You think affairs are easy to walk through? Ask people who have been through them and they're still together. Oh, but it's going to be better. There's a reason the Bible says shame never leaves your home. Ask somebody who is living in victory but has yet to tell their children because they wouldn't yet understand. Or ask somebody who has been cheated on if they're so grateful for the affair because it just made their life so much better. That's not true. It's pain. It's torment. It's demonic. All these things are associated with these sins and we want God to come in 
And Cinderella, the, the situation, just, oh, he made all things new. He can, absolutely. There are people in my life who I know, and I've watched him walk through, that he has made all things new. But if you were to ask them, do we wish we never happened? Well, it made us stronger. Do you wish it never happened? Nobody is ever going to say, yeah, I'm glad my sin happened. I'm glad that I was an alcoholic and wrecked my car and almost killed somebody, and I lost a uh, feeling in my left side of my body. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? If we keep thinking that deliverance is a cupcake and Cinderella story, you will never, ever ever walk through it. Because what happens is when it gets hard, you start blaming the devil for the demonic instead of realizing that God is protecting you in the midst of darkness. Does this make sense? See, we don't like this gospel. Can I tell you why? Because it's real. Because it's hard. It is hard whenever you are trying to break free from something that has a hold on your life. And the Israelites left. People hated them. They were burying their babies. They were burying bodies. They were burying these people, the firstborns in their family, and the Israelites are walking out with all their firstborns. Do you think they were saying, hey, hey, Jimmy, on the other side, baby, I'll see you. On the other side, Jimmy. No, they were, they were mad. They were angry. And I'll tell you why this is a hard thing for us to swallow, because when it's somebody we love that is close to us, that's around us all the time, it is so difficult to walk through your deepest pain if they're the ones who caused it. But I can tell you this, they're not the reason you can't forgive. That's on you. Doesn't mean you have to make it all new, but it means you have to be able to walk new. Does this make sense to you? Finally. And I love what it says, that they were led in a roundabout way through the wilderness. How many of y'all love God's roundabout ways? But they were going towards the Red Sea. Well, that's great, but they didn't know they were going towards the Red Sea because they didn't know they were supposed to walk through the Red Sea. They had no idea that this was on God's agenda for their deliverance. And I promise you, you have no idea what's on God's agenda for your deliverance. Because I'm thinking what you're thinking. If I'm the Hebrews, I'm saying, hey, God, once we get here, if we could go straight, that'd be great. Can we just get a straight line of wherever it is you're heading us and taking us? But God knew they were going through the Red Sea. The journey from Egypt was a brisk walk and supernatural. The Bible says there was a cloud that covered them by day and a fire that would take care of them at night. Now we're talking about millions of people, 600,000 men alone. Can you imagine the size of that cloud? And can you imagine the fire that went ahead of them? It was the biggest headlights you've ever seen in your life. These people weren't resting. They weren't stopping for food. They weren't stopping for rest stops. There was a supernatural power and ability God gave these people to walk to get the distance that they got away with the millions of people that they were walking with. A million people. And they walked and they walked and they walked along the edge of the sea. And on the one side, there was mountains. And they finally got to the place. On the other side, there was the Philistines. And here's the water. And so they have two options. Go towards the Philistines and try to fight a battle. They know they would lose because that wasn't what God had. Or walk up a 300-meter mountain with millions of people, wagons, animals, and your grandma. It's not going to happen. There's no way they can do this. The, 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 the mountains are too steep. The loss would be way too great. So they, God says, hey, let's turn around. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> we walked for days with your stinking cloud, this jabroni fire, <laughs> and you're going to, mm, Jesus, I'm, help me. You want me to walk back 12 miles. Do you see my grandma? <laughs> See my grandma? Did you, did you see her? 12, mi- 12 miles that way. Okay. You want, you want us to go back? See, this is where a lot of us stop. We've done your part, God. We've walked under your cloud that was supernaturally provided so that we wouldn't get sunburned. We've walked with your fire that he supernaturally provided so we'd get away and wouldn't be attacked from behind with spears and chariots. I'm done. Deliverance is not pretty. The only way across without opposition or dying in the mountains would eventually be the sea, but they had no idea. Any gift givers in here? You're like, man, I love giving gifts. That's my thing. I'm a gift giver. Yeah. Now, how many of y'all are the gift receivers? Right? See, nobody, that's different. See, we got one admitted, one admitted in the back. It's my barber. He's a truthful man. He's my psychologist. Tell him, I said, I don't pay you to cut my hair. I pay you to talk to me. He's the best. Those of you who like getting gifts aren't admitting it, and rightfully so, except for one, righteous in this room and online. 
this Christmas, I told my boys, this is going to be the best Christmas ever. You knew we moved at the end of October. We have nine, a little over nine acres. And so I grew up with a four-wheeler and I told my wife, we got to get these boys a four-wheeler fast because it's going to change their life. I feel the presence of God stirring us to do this. You're saying that's manipulation. You better believe it. She hears God, so she knows when I'm full of it. So I'm okay with that. And so I told my boys before Christmas, they had this list of things they wanted, but not on that list, nowhere was a four-wheeler because they knew that mom and dad, ain't, we don't spend money like that on, on Christmas presents generally. We're not going to do all that stuff. Because um, y'all know how it is. You buy all year, right? So it's like, no, nah, that is one day. This is Jesus's day. And uh, Jesus, it, Jesus is good. And so is mom and dad. So we ain't getting you nothing. It ain't about you. No, we just don't get them those big presents, right? We don't do a ton of that. And so uh, my boys, they didn't even think in their realm that they're getting a four-wheeler. Well, my realtor, when we bought the house, bought them a four-wheeler, but didn't, didn't tell them. He told me. And so it came on a pallet, and it was packaged. So I had them sit it in front of my garage, and my boys would walk by that thing every day for two months. And they did, there's a dad, one question, dad, what is that? Oh, it's just something for the house. You had a bunch of stuff getting shipped there, you know, things that we were doing to the house. And so it wasn't a big deal. They didn't think about it. For over two months, they walked by that pallet with their best Christmas present they could ever receive sitting on top. They had no idea. And I didn't pay for it, which is even better. And so Christmas Eve comes around and Father-in-law had put it all together. He had tightened up the parts that needed to be tightened up so that they were ready for it. And on Christmas morning, we had opened up all the presents. My kids were ecstatic. They could not believe what, what, what had happened on Christmas morning. It was the best Christmas ever. I said, get your hopes up. Coming into Christmas, get your hopes up. My wife said, Brandon, you're going to give it away. You always do this. You always say so much that they know. I said, I don't say too much. I said, but I have joy in my life, and I will not hold them back from the joy that is going to be on them on Christmas Day. I want to build it up. I want to build it. She says, you are going to give it away. You just all the time. You say so much. I say, you stop right now. I do not say too much. Guys, it's got four wheels and a handlebar, but you have no idea what it is. And I said, you stop it. And she said, you stop it. I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just lost it there, babe. I'm sorry. Forgive me, please. I love you so much. Jubilation, Christmas morning, they're rocking their new slippers. They got their robes. My boys wear robes all the time. It's just what we do in the shank house. They rock their robes. It don't matter how old you are. You come down with the robe, baby. You say, oh, this, is my, this, is, this is what I do in the mornings, right? They got their robes on. Jubilation. So they open up a package. And in the package were these, were the helmets and the goggles and the gloves. And they open them up. They're like, oh, this is cool. We got to go outside and like, ride our bikes. It's like, can I take it through the woods? And we're like, oh, yeah. And then we gave them a little box. And Ryland opens up the box and he pulls them up like keys. What am I doing with some keys? And the boys lose it. Like we got criers immediately. There's like, oh God, you're faithful. Oh, nobody like my God. Oh my gosh, this can't be real. Am I real right now? And Asher's like, let's ride. <laughs> and they take off running outside. And I'm in front of them because I can't wait. And I open up. Oh, it's real. Oh, am I real? I can't believe it. I'm so happy. Oh, dad, you're the best. Thank you. Bring it in, boys. Bring it in. You right here, right here. Let's go. Let's go. It's actually from your realtor. But that, that's, forget that part. Everything else is true. Forget that part. It's from the realtor. We'll talk about him later. And they're all like, yeah, just letting it eat, right? Beautiful. It's the way kids should grow up. But you know what's interesting about this? They walked by the best present they've ever had, had no idea it was in the box for two months and didn't pay a bit of mind to it because it looked like a box on a crate. And that, to kids, means work. <laughs> nobody touched it. Nobody bothered it. It didn't look like much. But what God has for you is greater than what you're asking for. And I can tell you this. You may not know it, but you've been walking by it. It's already around you. You just can't see it yet. It's right there. The roundabout wasn't a different route. It was the main route. They said, let's take the bones of Joseph. He had requested that. Joseph brought all of the Hebrews into Egypt. And he says, when you leave, take my bones with you out of Egypt. Say, yeah, we got to honor who's before us. But I want to know, what are you willing to do for your freedom? 
What is it you're really willing to do? They said the Lord went ahead of them. There's a cloud. There was a pillar. The Lord did not remove the cloud and he didn't remove the fire. But even when we can see God before us or that he's provided what's in front of us, we lack the faith to believe that he's still in it with us. It's right in front of you. And what you have to understand is there's evidence of God's presence all around you. It's in so many things. You say, well, I just need you, God. He is there. If you can't see him, it's because of your perspective, not because that box doesn't have a four-wheeler in it. It is because you can't see what's actually in front of you. Psalm chapter 51, verse 11. I love what David says. He says, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. His presence is him being present. That's what his presence means. It's a glimpse of heaven on earth. I love what it says in Romans chapter one when Paul tells the church in Rome, he says, forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. How many of y'all like nature? We live at the beach. How many of y'all love to just watch the waves? How many of y'all love the mountains? How many of y'all love the sand? How many of y'all love the woods? How many of y'all love sunsets? How many of y'all like cloudy days? How many of y'all love snow? How many of y'all love rain? How many of y'all love sunrises? How many like the hot summers? How many like the change of the leaves? How many of y'all like the palm trees? Come on, Palms Church. You gotta like the palm trees or else you are not invited here anymore. We've never in the history of our church kicked anybody out, but right now it's about to be the first. You like palm trees, I like palm trees. That's our favorite thing, right? Represent, palm. We are palms. If you've said yes to any of those things and you can't deny that you have seen his presence, that's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter one. It says, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Why? Because his presence is him being present and he shows you the minute you walk out of here and even in here in his people, his presence is present all the time. There's no way around it. His presence is in everything. So they're marching out of Egypt. People are burying their dead, their children, the leaders of the community. And as Israel is leaving, God puts the cloud above them and a fire in front of them at nighttime. And he says, there is a road that makes the most sense through this territory. It's the main road and it's the shortest route, but you're not going that way. And they're thinking, well, God, you brought us out of here. You had 10 plagues. You have a cloud above us and a fire in front of us. Why can't you just take us on the shortest road? Is there anybody else in here that's wondering that same question? Because that's what I want to know. What is it about that road that you can't do, but you can bring locusts? You got everybody having, you got boils all over Egypt right now, but you have trouble with this Philistines in the road. Anybody wondering that, or is it just me? Why is it that when you finally get us out, after 430 years, you decide not to take us down the main road? Well, the Bible says he didn't take them down the main road because he knew they would face something that they personally could not overcome, even with his help. Because he knew they weren't, that there, they weren't there yet. If they face a battle, they're not going to be able to take it. You're saying, well, give them supernatural strength. Well, they have to rely on him for that first. See, he knew that if he took them down this road, they weren't there yet to face an army and let him fight. They were in process. How many of y'all are in process? He knew that there was a process that they were walking through. He said, they're not ready for this. And you're thinking, well, God, they just took all of the wealth of the Egyptians. They put blood above their doors so that the death angel wouldn't come to their house. They have their, their, their dough rollers and their, all their dough stuff on their shoulders. And they have bread that's, that, that has no yeast in it because they took off in the middle of the night. What do you mean they don't have faith? He's like, they're just not there. Because eventually they would fight and they would win. And these weren't even warriors. But he was saying, you got to take them down a different route. But what God keeps telling people is the reason I'm doing this isn't just because they're not ready, but I have a means to this destination for people to see my glory. And so if your life is really about God's glory, then my question to you would be, why are we so resistant to the roundabouts? Because they, the roundabouts exist for God's glory. They're not always, ex you're saying, well, that's not the best for me. That's because you don't trust them. That has nothing to do with whether or not it's actually the best. 
The roundabouts exist for a reason, Exodus chapter 14. So they left Egypt and they're marching and it says, then the Lord gave Moses these instructions. Order the Israelites to turn back. Oh, are you kidding me? Everybody say turn back. This sounds like it's getting to be a little bit of a circus. You're talking about millions of people. We're going to march out. We took all the wealth. They're wailing because their kids are dead, which you know, this is about to get ugly. There's a route that's the shortest in the main road, but you tell me, don't go that way. And you say we're going to go in a roundabout way. And now we're stuck between there's mountains here, the Philistines are there, and the Red Sea is here. And this is your idea of deliverance. You see, that's where we sit. A lot of us get to a place where we are so mad at God with the way he has taken us through deliverance that we become embittered and we lose our drive for deliverance. This is not what I asked for. How dare you? I don't know why I'm sitting in this dark space in my life. Well, that has nothing to do with God's direction. You see what happens whenever we're not being delivered in a way we'd hoped. Things come out of us that were actually in us. Not things that were in us because God placed them there. And those are the moments where we get bitter or better. We get angry. We get resentful and and frustrated. Or we say, you know what, God? I surrender. I surrender. I'm wondering how many of you right now are in a place where you, you have been working so hard towards deliverance. It's not that you've done things wrong. You're just not willing to turn back. It just doesn't make sense to you, so you just can't do it. It says the Israelites to turn back and camp by pi between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore, across from Baal Zephon. The, then the Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused that they're trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. Now listen to this part. <laughs> Ooh, I can't even read it. I'm so mad. I can't even read this. I'm so frustrated with you, God. I'm not your puppet. You ain't no, you're not the puppet master. I'm so bitter. I have planned this in order to display my glory. What? You're using me to display your glory? You selfish God. This, this pain that you didn't cause, but you're delivering me from, isn't being exercised the way that I had hoped and you're doing it for your glory? You're bringing me more pain for your glory? And he's saying, no, I'm bringing you less, but you just can't see it because you're still not looking at me and my glory. When I went through years and years and years and years of sexual abuse, I went through three years. I was so bitter at God, but I preached. I preached the gospel as much love as I could conjure up and it kept me alive. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? I could take you back to the days, the moments, the hours, what I was wearing, the smells of the rooms, what weather it was outside, the smell of the grass. I could take you back to every moment of everything. You know what God said to me? He says, Brandon, you have no idea what I've saved you from. Say, well, you're God. Why couldn't you just make them disappear? Why couldn't you just destroy it? He said, you have no idea what I saved you from. And you know what I feel like he's speaking to me now? He's been speaking to it all morning. We're headed up to Oakland this week. Is that I am going to display my glory through your life. We went a roundabout way. You have no idea what I saved you from, but I'm going to display my glory in ways that you've never imagined. What if, he's, what if he's speaking that to you? Well, let me rephrase it. He's saying the same thing to us. I'm gonna display my glory through your life. He said, I have, I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. And after this, the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord. So wait, my roundabout and my turning back is gonna... The Egyptians are going to see your glory because I was willing to not try to climb up the 300 meter mountain with grandma and my wagons and my animals. And I wasn't trying to swim across the Red Sea without you parting. And I wasn't going to go and just fight the Philistines. I'm a guy who I said, forget it. 
Give me, let's go fight the Philistines. I need a couple of SEAL Team 6 guys around here. Anybody got here? Anybody got a stick? Anybody got a stick? I think if we can be honest for a minute, a lot of us, we just got to finally, and now we're turning back. We just got to this place where I thought you're really delivering me. I thought you're really doing things. I, I thought this was the one that was going to work out, and, and now we're turning back. But this is something that I have learned about faith that has been true, and the word teaches it is that faith will take you to the end of yourself and to the end of what you believe in God, and then it'll take another step forward. Turning back is not a different plan. It's the same plan. It's just not your plan. It's what God always had planned. Why are we turning back? Can we just get this off our chest? Can you just say, why are we turning back? That has to feel a little bit good, right? Let's ask God that question. God, why are we turning back? I love what 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. For we live by believing and not seeing. You gotta love that one. Or Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see through their faith that people in days of old earned a good reputation. So how do we do this? We're listening to this and we're saying, what God has for you is greater than what you're looking and asking for. There's evidence of God's presence all around you and you're hearing it. But what does that mean for us? It means that turn back even after finally. That's what you need to do. Turn back even after you feel like it's over, after you feel like the path to deliverance was set, after you feel like you understood. Turn back even after finally. I'll tell you what happens if you don't. You start to think you know more than you know. That's where pride sets in. That's where arrogance sets in. That's where darkness sets in is when you think, listen, and church, listen to me when I say this. I am asking, and one thing I am praying for you this year is for discernment. I am praying for God's people to grow close to him to where they have discernment about the ferocious wolves that try to reap among you or try to sleep among you. I pray for discernment for your marriage in, the, in 2024. I pray for discernment in how you're talking and, and pa- parenting your kids. I, I'm praying for discernment over Palms Church that you will begin to understand the greater things and, and you will understand people that you're saying they're just not, there's something not right and you don't have to know what it is but you have a discernment to know that God is saying after finally I need people who are willing to turn back. I need people who are willing to see things bigger than themselves and their life and their culture and their understanding. I need people who are willing to see me and willing to see me use their life to display my glory, but it'll do things in a roundabout way they could have never thought, they could ever ask for or imagine. God is looking for people who can discern a move of God in a person and won't sit there and blame God and point fingers, but they're willing to turn back to who he is. Is there anybody who is willing to turn back and you're saying, I'm willing to commit to turn back. I'm willing to admit to go to the roundabout way. Stop crying and complaining about the things in your life whenever you've gone down a path God hasn't asked you to go and you're not willing to turn back. You're not willing to go in a roundabout way to the dream that you think he's put in your heart. Turning back feels like you're wasting time, but you don't realize it's saving your life. You see, we want to get there quickly, but God, we want to get there. We want to get there so badly. We want to get there quickly, but God just knows we'll get there eventually. It's a very different mindset. The main route isn't always the shortest route. And that's what they didn't realize. It's not the shortest. There are things that have happened in my life that I look back and I am thinking, you picked on me that day. That was, that was, And there were some traumatic things. There were some dark things and some hard things, but is anybody willing to admit you're saying, I definitely feel like God chose me that day just to make an example so that everybody could see, do not do this. Anybody? And the rest of y'all just too spiritual or you're lying. One or the other. When I was a senior in high school, my sister had a cool car, a Dodge Neon. We put some plastic 16 inch chrome rims on it. So nice. Spinners. My parents had gone. Actually, they weren't spinners. Those were on my car. My parents had gone, and they said, do not go anywhere while we're gone. I had my license. My sister had her license, but I didn't have a car. I said, sure. And they're actually here, so they may be hearing this for the first time. 
we had somebody in our church that said, hey, we have tickets to the Orioles game. Do you guys want to go? I said, yeah, absolutely you want to go. And my sister was like, well, how are you going to get there? I'm like, your car. She's like, first of all, mom and dad said you couldn't go. In case you don't know, we live on the western side of D.C., which means you got to drive through D.C., through Baltimore to get there. I said, that's fine. I'm grown. Like I said, I'm 16. I got my license. So two of my buddies <clears throat> live right beside me. Say, hey guys, I got three tickets. Y'all want to go? They're like, we're down, bro. Let's go to Baltimore and kick it. I think they were 10th grade, 9th grade. It's like, let's go. I mean, what parent wouldn't let your kid drive through D.C. into Baltimore at 16 with two kids that are like 14? I don't know. Their parents gave them permission. It was cool. I didn't tell them. My parents didn't. I just said, yeah, man, I'm going. Y'all want to go? They said, yeah, let's ride. So we had Nelly going, if you want to take a ride. I drove that neon all the way to Baltimore. I just, man, I felt so good. Parked it, walked down to the Hard Rock Cafe, had some dinner before we kicked it. Actually, no, we didn't. We went right to the stadium because we're almost late because of rush hour. Welcome to DC. Went to the game, had a great time, great seats, box seats. Then we walked down to the harbor because that's where the nightlife happens. I'm 16. There's got to be something going on down here. Went to Hard Rock Cafe. Then it's about midnight, which I don't think there was a curfew back then. If there was, I'm repenting publicly. About midnight, get back to the parking lot outside of Camden Yards. My buddy says, hey, throw me the keys so I can unlock the door. It's a neon, man. We didn't have all the fancy stuff. I got you, dog. Giant manhole. Uh oh. I said, what'd you, what'd, you, what'd you do? What'd you do, man? I said, you play basketball. You're like on varsity and you're like 13. Like, how, how'd that happen? Ah, I don't know. It just hit my hands. I was like, yeah, that, we're in trouble. We're in, we're in trouble. I said, all right, let's, let's figure this out. So we asked some guys around us to, some of the vendors were closing up. They had been in the parking lot and we said, hey man, can y'all help us get it? No, we can't, man. Can't do nothing like that. Gotta go home, man. I said, all right, cool. Thank you for nothing. Next guy, hey man, do you mind if you come over here? We gotta get like this. We gotta get these keys, brother. Like, oh, I'll be backtrack. The reason I threw him the keys, I just remembered. We were jumping in my car because I left the lights on. So I threw him the keys to unlock the other door after the, 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 the hood was up and the battery was dead. And so we're asking, hey, can you guys come give us a jump? Nah, man, we gotta go, gotta go. I was like, all right. I was like, well, listen, first things first, we gotta get the keys so we can start the car when somebody does offer to give us a jump. So what are we gonna do? And you know, they're fierce warriors. They said, let's just lower one of us down in there. I said, okay, you, you go down there. So we lifted the manhole cover, all three of us. Ah, Hercules probably weighed about two or 3,000 pounds, something in there. And we lifted it off and my buddy went down. There was no ladder. And he started crawling and we grabbed his ankles. He said, all right, buddy, you trust us? He said, yes, you do. So we did this, the squat. All right, here we go. Get down there. It's scary down here. Shut up. Get the keys. Bro, give me up. Give me up. Do you got my keys? Give me up. Do you got my keys? Yes. Okay. And we got him out of there and it was jubilation. The keys came out of the sewer. And then here comes an angel of the Lord. Smoking a black and mild, pushing a cotton candy cart. I said, hey, man, I know you got to, yeah, I got you, bro. I'll come jump you. I said, I knew, I knew he was an angel when I saw him from a distance. He said, that's blasphemy. You be a 16-year-old down in Baltimore with your keys stuck in a sewer, and you don't call somebody an angel that bumps, jumps your car. At that point, anyone was spiritual, they gave me a jump. We got in the car, headed home. Everybody got nestled into their beds. I parked the neon, mint condition, put the keys in my sister's room, went to bed. It was a long time later that my parents found out I went to Baltimore. Long enough to where I was way beyond having to get punished. But I can tell you this, as a 16-year-old boy, boy, child, in Baltimore, without my parents' permission, when, when, those, when I knew that we needed to jump, I felt desperate. But when the keys went in the sewer, I wasn't scared about the discipline. At that point, I was concerned with survival. It changed. I, my thought was never, my parents are going to kill me. My thought was, I hope we get out of here. That was my thought. I mean, you would think that being three kids in the middle of a field, let alone in the middle of a city at night, in a giant parking lot. And see, what happens in our life 
is that you have been through things that some are funny now that we think about it. At the time, it wasn't. Maybe a little funny. Some are devastating, some are heavy. But I can tell you that night, I know God went before us. We had three kids in the middle of a city. I have the same stories of when I was in college and we were driving down to Panama City for a trip we should never went on and blew both my tires out and good Samaritans that came away, uh, came along and Walmart happened to have the two tires that I needed at 10 o'clock at night and for whatever reason they were still open their tire department and they put tires on my car. I have stories in my life as a young man when I was in college or when I was in high school that I can tell you God's present was present. And I don't look back at these stories of, oh, I got my parents. They can tell you I was a great kid, great kid best athlete they've ever raised, best student they could have imagined. But the reality is I can look back at my life and I can tell you the lessons I've learned from things where I knew God's presence was the present thing that got me through whatever I was in as a kid. And that's what you want for your children. For them, when they get out of your house, say, but God's presence, he was with me. When my boys, even when they're young, they get nervous about something. They say, that's all right, God will be with me. When they can learn that, not because mom and dad have said it, but because they've experienced it, their life is gonna be changed. But I think as adults, when you understand that, your life's gonna be changed. Why? Because God is asking us, will we after finally turn back and will we trust him? Will you trust God with the roundabout that you feel like you're on right now? You say, well, I've caused it. Sure you have. Maybe it was your sin that caused your roundabout. Maybe it was your lack of discipline that caused the roundabout. Maybe it was your inability to control your anger that caused the roundabout. However, when you get to the place you feel like you deserve and that God is gonna bring you to, and he says, hey, I know you already got to the finally and you think this is the destination, but will you turn back 12 miles? to something you don't wanna do and go to a place you don't wanna go to cross the sea you are not interested in crossing because I'm gonna display my glory through your life and whatever you thought I had for you, it's so much bigger than that. This isn't a story out of a history book. This is evidence of God and he wants to do it in your life. Will you stand with me this morning? I'm gonna ask our prayer team to go ahead and come down. This is how I want to end this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to pray with you. And we're going to sing. But what I want to do is I want to give you a moment. I think reflection is one of the most underrated things that we do in our life. Because it's scary reflecting on things. Sometimes it's really hard. But what I want to do today is I want to ask you, would you let us pray with you? Would you let us, would you let us Believe with you for God as he's taking that roundabout, as you're taking those turns. You see what happens a lot of times, there is two cultures in a church. There's one that's broken and contrite and willing and people are going after the things of God. And there's another one that's about diplomacy. It's more about the way people view you than it is about you actually getting help and getting healed and God doing things in your life that only he can do. And I'm gonna tell you that Palms is not a diplomacy church. We're a church that we say, hey, listen, all you who are broken and weary and ravaged, this is your home. All you who aren't, that's great too, but we don't wanna be a church where we're about diplomacy. We are a place where, listen, you, if you're sick, you go to a hospital. You don't go somewhere that it looks like it's good. No, you want somewhere you can get healing. The house of God, there is no place better where you can find the things in your life that are necessary. The church saved my life. And I'm asking you today, you might be on a roundabout. You may God, you may be at a finally moment and God's saying, turn back. I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is we're going to pray together and we're going to pray for those of you who don't know Jesus. We're going to pray together collectively and we're going to pray together that God will come in and he will come in and meet you in this moment that you will meet the savior of your life. And then after that, I'm going to give an invite for those of you that would like to have our prayer team pray with you. And we're going to pray that as you're getting to your finally moment, some of you are going to turn back. Some of you are not even to your finally yet. And you know that God is stirring things. Some of you are in your finally moment. And now he's saying, well, take a roundabout. And you're not even at the turn back yet, but you're in different phases. Some of you feel like you've achieved it and you've accomplished it, but you're empty. And God is saying, because I'm not done. The picture of it looks like it, but I'm not done. And others, you're in a moment where you're just trying to figure it all out. And God's saying, I'm not done. Rest assured that you're not in a position that God doesn't see. He's right there with you. His presence is present. How many of you can say, I've been praying for something for a long time and I have, I'm weary. Anybody willing to admit that? You're saying, I'm believing God for something for a long time. I'm just weary. I'm ready for him to do something in my life, but I'm tired, man. 
gosh, I'm tired. Some of you have been praying for something specific. It could be a family member. It could be a home. It could be your marriage. And you're just ready for God to move. Let me promise you, he is. He is. He's moving. You bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for this incredible, incredible opportunity and time we get to spend with you. But Lord, I pray right now for each and every person who's in this place where they're wanting to know you. They're wanting to receive you as their Lord and Savior. They're wanting to submit and surrender their life. For those of you today, you're saying, Brandon, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to ask you, will you say this prayer? Will you say, dear Jesus, I surrender. I give you all that I am and all that I have. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And today I surrender. If you said that, we would love to know. Let us know. But I'm gonna pray for all of you that are standing here today and you're saying, Brian, I I just want prayer to get to the finally or prayer in the roundabout or prayer when he says, turn back. Lord, I pray over your people today. God, I pray right now that they would begin to sense and see that your presence is present. If you're believing God for something today, will you just lift your hands to the heavens? Will you just show him? He already knows your heart, but would you just give him your hands right now? Lift them to heaven. Wherever you're at, whatever couch you're on, whatever room you're in, just lift them to heaven. God, we ask right now in Jesus' name that you would see your people, that they would see that you have called them out, that God, you are delivering them from a place that seems so tragic and so hopeless and so heavy. God, I pray for the humility to seep into the hearts of your people today, that God, the humility would bring a brokenness that can bring change. I pray for those today who just seem overwhelmed and they just seem like it's easier to be a a diplomat than to be broken. I pray that today they would see that God, you are a safe place, that your church, your people are a safe place to heal. God, that we wouldn't try to create an image, that we would walk in the goodness and the image of our God. Father, I pray that you would begin to speak to those hearts that are in the roundabouts right now, that they would know they're not going in circles, even though it may feel like that. For those that you're saying, turn back, that it's not a different route, it's your route, that God, it may not seem like the shortest route, but it's the best route. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll bring a peace that helps us to pass all understanding, that helps us to be overwhelmed with your presence and your goodness and your mercy. Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that your people would receive all that you are, knowing that you are faithful and that God, as we surrender to you, you will do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever think, ask or imagine in Jesus name come on would you sing with us would you come forward let us pray with you come on palms
promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life, all over my life. Can we give God some praise for His goodness and His grace and His mercy? Hey, thanks so much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss any new content or videos. We're here live every week. We'll see you soon.